Right. This is exclusive for Meg, for <laughs> Buckingham Uni. <laughs> B-U-T-V. Is that, what, is that what you call it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Bernie Marston is a world-renowned rock and blues guitarist and has enjoyed a varied career in the music industry. He began recording with UFO but is probably most famous for being a founding member of Whitesnake, co-writing the most successful worldwide hits. I met with Mr Marsden in the University of Buckingham's music room to discuss his life in music, playing a Shakespearean minstrel on stage and owning one of the best and most famous Gibson Les Paul guitars ever made. We also had a chat about the Beatles. He is justifiably referred to as an unsung legend of British rock guitar. So firstly, thank you very much for agreeing to meet us. My pleasure. I understand you've had a long association with Buckingham. Has the town changed much since you first lived <coughs> here? About uh, yeah, 180, 360 degrees. I think there's almost as many people at the university now than lived in Buckingham when I was a, when I was a kid. Mm. Not maybe, maybe within a thousand people. So there's a couple of thousand people here now, isn't yes, there? Yes, exactly. Well, I think Buckingham was about 3,000 maybe when I, when I was growing up. Oh, okay. So it's changed dramatically. All this was kind of the old part of town, and I can remember all this area when it was farmyard buildings, and I think there was a, kind of a, a pig farm over to the left here and stuff. It, it was all broken down. It was all falling apart. Oh. So it's great to be able to see it all um, come out of the... Ashes, so to speak, the phoenix, like a phoenix rising. It's good. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Um, so I understand you learnt to play guitar by ear. Yeah. And how old were you when you started to learn to play? I always say 15, but I think I was probably a, a bit, a bit uh, before that. So I was probably 14, probably in four. I just had to work out what Beatles record I had at the time, so that's about it. Yeah. Um, I understand um, it was influential blues artists who made you want to play the guitar, is that correct? Well, yeah, that's, that's more or less true. I, um, I have a cousin who's a bit older than me, and he lived in Liverpool during that time when I was 14. And Liverpool was the centre of the earth musically in those days because the Beatles came from there. And I used to go and visit him when I was, say, 13 or 14. He'd be 16, 17, but he was in a band, so it was awfully impressive. And um, I was just about to start playing the guitar, and when he came down to see me probably six months later, maybe a little bit longer. I'd learnt to play things by um, the Swinging Blue Jeans or the Dave Clark Five, and uh, he was quietly impressed without saying so, because you know him being the older cousin, I was playing quite well. And he said, well, if you can learn that, throw it at, you know, that's all rubbish. He said, learn this, and he gave me some American blues records. Mm. So that was a really big turning point for me because I was listening to the right stuff at the age of about 15. As far as I was concerned, you know, it's managed to work. I'm still learning from it today, so I don't think I'd have got much from the swinging blue jeans past the, the <laughs> age of 16, so there you go. So learning guitar seems ludicrously difficult by modern standards. You've got all these visual aids available, yet it seems constant that guitarists from your era are rightly venerated and lauded as mm. being mm. so technically proficient. Why do you think that is? It sounds magical, doesn't it? Yes. Um, it, it is, I, I, I don't believe it is. Um, if you wanted to play the guitar when I was 15, let's, let's go to 15, you had to do it yourself. There was no, there were guitar teachers, but they would have wanted you to play like Segovia. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that's almost like, to me, it was like saying, I play the guitar. Well, that was like playing the trumpet or something, because it wasn't the music I wanted to play. And I'd heard Bob Dylan by then, so, you know. So the only way you could do it was by listening to records. And you know, if you had a good ear, you could pick it up and, you know, even playing along with a theme, you know, to Coronation Street on the TV, and then your mum and dad or maybe would say, or would say, oh, that sounded quite like it. You know, you think, oh, well, I'm on the way, you know. And that was the only way. So I, I think that's why a lot of us from my era 
are still around because we had to learn that way. Mm. And not one of us had a chance to go to a tab or to a video or a DVD. And, you know, I've been asked to do DVDs several times. I've never really done it yet. I do have a couple of things online um, on my website, but uh, I don't know. It's a bit like opening your soul. I just, you know, it took me a long time to play like I do. And if you open it all up in one 45 minute DVD, I think you kind of, for whatever you gain in, you, I think you may lose a little bit in, uh, in your soul. So there you go. Understood. Were your family very musical? Uh, no, not really. You mean as players? Yes. No, no nobody at all, oh. apart from this cousin of mine who, yeah. who had, uh, was a self-taught harmonica player. So, uh, but that was because of the boom, you know. But uh, family-wise, no, not at all. You've made reference to technical proficiency with respect to playing like vibrato, for instance, that it's difficult to teach and you've either got it or you haven't. So do you reckon that guitarists are born rather than made or is it something that is overcome with determination? I maintain that vibrato is impossible to teach. You can show people how you do it, but there's only, it, it's individual to every player, especially when you get to a certain level. Mm. And uh, some players from my younger days, guys the same age as me, there was a, Eric Clapton had a unique vibrato. Paul Kossoff from a band called Free, uh, who you may not know, but uh, well worth checking out. Peter Green was much cleaner, mm. shorter. And it was a great time, Jimi Hendrix. So when I'm 17, I had all these guys to listen to on an hourly basis. Or go, or go and see them at weekends. You say, well, Friday we'll see Hendrix. Saturday clapped and Sunday, that's how good it was. So I wouldn't change anything, you know, regarding that. So the vibrato thing just comes from, I think, from wanting to emulate some of your heroes. B.B. King does it one way only, mm -hmm. and he's done it since day one. And I still try to do, say try, I would like to be able to play like him, but I still can't, I still try. But uh, he says I play all right, so that's <laughs> Do it okay then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've read before that you um, love trying to imitate Jimi Hendrix licks and as well as um, Eric Clapton vibrato. Have you actually seen them live at all? Yeah, I saw Hendrix a few times, Clapton many times. H Hendrix was, uh, it was from another planet. I mean, you never try to, say, try to emulate Hendrix or learn. I mean, you could still be learning today, you know. He did it his way, li literally. That whole left-handed thing with different pressure, mm. his thumb was like a... Th fifth finger and and he was just a great great player and mm. uh, we'll never ever see the likes of, of him again I believe. I think you're right. Do you think the record business and particularly the genre of rock is more difficult to break into today than it was in the 60s and 70s? Um, I think there's more issues on image these days well I, I know there is um, mm. see these days the last 20 years really the, especially the Britpop era was and I think I heard one of the guys yesterday after the, the Brits said uh, there's a lot more to wearing a mini skirt and being in a girl van, you know, you know, which obviously was alluding to the Spice Girls when they were. But on the other side, they sold I think three million records in a month or something. Yeah. Oh, well, it's the record business. They, you know, you if you're an artist, you wish you could sell your paintings. So it, you might not like the Spice Girls. You might they might not be your bag. But if they're that successful, you know try and sort of humour it a little bit, you know, you, you don't, nobody forces you to listen to it. And if they sold three million records, that means people, some of my contemporaries say, well, that means there's three million idiots out there. Well, I don't go along with that. I, I wouldn't have bought it myself. Mm. But, uh, you know, it's a difficult business. So the rock thing is, is pretty constant. When Whitesnake began, I, I, it was after the punk boom in the mid, late 70s. And we started off booking a tour, smallish theatres in, in the UK. And everybody was talking about dinosaur rock bands, you know, the people like Eric Clapton and all that. And, you know, they've, they've had their time and now it's time for the punks. Well, the big drawback with the punks, and, I, and I, I hated that, so I hated it, you know, much more than I would have ever heard any animosity towards something like the Spice Girls or, you know, that, or, or One Direction, you know, because they're wholesome and they're kind of cool. and. Mm. You know, they, they don't hurt me to watch them. I didn't like the whole punk thing because it wasn't about musicianship. It was about this nasty imagery and I, I couldn't understand that at all. But we booked this tour and they sold out quietly 
we got to the shows and they were sold out. They weren't huge, mm. they became huge, but they thought, well, hang on, I thought we were, you know, we were finished. They said, no, no, this will just stick around. And I have some old magazines still around my studio and uh, the headliners of 1985 are still the headliners of today. Elton John, Dire Straits, or Mark Knopfler, Eric Clapton. These guys are still around. It's got to be a reason for that. I think one of the main reasons why people like myself are still making records and gigging is because of that whole punk thing, which I now kind of thank, because my generation brought up these really, really good players, whether you were a drummer, guitar player, who you wanted to be, Jimi Hendrix. You could never really do it, but you wanted to be. And that brought people who could write good songs and play good. The punk thing didn't. What do, we, what do we have left from the punk thing, really? Johnny Rotten, you know, selling butter. You know, which isn't really the, you know, the image that he would have wanted in 1977, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, good luck to Johnny, because he's still uh, a face of the, uh, the new uh, millennium, so, so to speak. I think I was very against all that. I now think it's one of the main reasons why I'm still able to be kind of fairly prominent in, in the, uh, still doing what I do, what I enjoy. Equally, do you reckon that um, artists from those eras are still playing um, to like stadium and at Glastonbury because there are no new artists coming through? I think there are the artists coming through. Whether they'll have the longevity of, I think this year they're talking about Dolly Parton being at Glastonbury, yeah. which is great. But people from my generation and people from your generation can get an equal amount of pleasure through seeing an artist like Dolly Parton, who is, I've seen live, who is incredible. You know, forget the imagery and what she kind of, you know, perpetuates, you know, the image of, of what she is. But she's a great musician, a great songwriter. And the Stones last year, at, was it last year at Glastonbury? Yes. You know, I mean, there was more people under the age of their children there, probably. And yet, I think everybody had a great time. Mm. There, there's a, probably a certain amount of, well, I saw the Stones kind of thing. But, you know, so what? You know, it's if, if people enjoy it, and you, you pay your ticket and enjoy yourself. You know, I was there last year backstage, dropping people off, and then getting the hell out of there. So that was it. <laughs> well, I understand you began your professional recording career with UFO in 1973, yeah. and also spent time working with the producer Mickey Most as his in-house mm. guitarist of choice, mm. Mm. Um, recording sessions for top 10 acts, including Hot Chocolate's hits, um, You Sexy Thing. I, th I believe so, yeah, I was told so, yeah. Yes. I, what, what happened, <laughs> I can tell you now. Um, I did a lot of work with Mickey Most. Mickey Most was basically, for this day and age, he was the Simon, he was the Simon Cowell of his time. Mm. He controlled pretty much everything he did from making the record to almost, I used to believe he could say, well, I think we'll make this one be number three in the charts. And if it got to number two, he'd ask questions. You know, That's what the, what the image I always got from Mickey. But I did a lot of work with him in the studio, and, but I would be working on backing tracks and then afterwards, I say, oh, what's that for? He said, oh, that was, that was a hot chocolate track you've just done. You know, it's one of the new tracks they've just done. I just wanted you on this type of thing. And there, was a, there were other bands as well. Uh, uh, Science Direct. I thought I did some uh, stuff with The Arrows and Racy. And, but at the time, I didn't realise it was, it was just a session. You know, he'd pick me up and take me down to his studio. And I was always... Because he, would, he was doing a TV show at the time. And I was like, wow, this is the guy who was on TV last week. And I'm in his car now. You know, so... But he was really good, and I learned a lot from Mickey Most. He was fantastic in the studio. Mm. Really, I don't know, people would say, kind of like a Phil Spector for the UK, really. He, when he made a record, he knew what the record would sound like before we put the first part down. He knew what it was going to finish like. Whether you wanted to do it or not, it was his record. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've read that um, Jimmy Page similarly contributed to session guitar mm. in virtually every 60s top 10 hit. Yeah, pretty much. I so think. was session work a similarly positive experience for you because you were like, practicing? Session work was um, extra money, mm. really. Uh, artistically, I don't think that was always a criteria which looks bad, really. It was always nice to be asked because, you know, you say that. I remember doing some sessions for Mickey with a very very good guy was a big uh, film guy, a guy called John Cameron. And he hired me for several big sessions for movies. And he would go out with the, with the sheet music and go all around the guys and I'd be going, oh no, you know, because I don't, you know, I didn't read music, I don't read music now. Uh, I could sight read, but that's about it. Give me the dots and it's like, whoa, you know. And John would come around and when he got to me, he would put it on, upside down on my music tray. 
and just give me give me a wink say just do what you do it's in g it's in a or whatever and i do my thing and they say great so you know it, it kind of um i was a bit uh, daunted by it because all these sighted you know reading musicians around me mm -hmm. and then one of the guitar players next to me another two guitar players he was then you know was a great player and played everything if a, if a fly had walked across the stave he would have played that note you know and he was then most intrigued with how I got the sound I was getting from just the same amplifier as him, basically. And, and I said, well, I, I don't know, you know. And that made me realize that there was different types of being a successful musician. I was only, you know, 22, 23 then. So, and um, I was quite naive, but you learn quickly in those situations. Yes. They call it, uh, what do they call it, roasting. You know, you either sink or swim. And unfortunately, I swam. But the, people like John Cameron and Mickey Mouse, they were, you know, very helpful to me, although, I guess, looking back on it, I was there on merit because they wanted me to do what I did. Mm. But it was a great time. It was a great time. You had the opportunity to join Paul McCartney's Wings. Was it, <laughs> was it um, a difficult decision to join Whitesnake over your boyhood? Yeah. I had a call from um, McCartney's office uh, at, uh, late, late in 77. And a friend of mine had been the guitar player in Wings before guy called Jimmy McCulloch and he was a good pal of mine and he had been let go from Wings and whatever and the sax player in Wings was the guy I'd been working with for the previous six months in the band I was in with John Lord and Ian Pace so when Jimmy left Wings Howie recommended me to Paul McCartney I then got a call from his office to say you know it's not an audition, we'd like just to have a play together. And, but that play, that playing together never happened. And in the interim between the calls, two or three calls, and me never getting to actually play with Paul because I'd been asked by David Coverdale to form Whitesnake. So uh, that's the real story. So turning down the chance to join Wings is not, I, I wouldn't say. Yeah. You know, the, 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 I turned down the opportunity to possibly be in Wings, but I kind of, I wouldn't have done something, anything like, I think, in the previous, in the next 30 years. Yes. Because Whitesnake became quite good. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it was a dilemma, yeah, but there mm. was, he was doing, the one, number one at the time was Mull of Kintyre. You know, and I'm 25, you know, I'm a bit of a rocker, and I'm going, Mull of Kintyre. Not really me, no. you, know, you know. But then you go, it's one of the Beatles, you know. Mm. So it was, it wasn't really a the the the, vi the vibe that David and I had at these the initial White Snake sessions. You know, you just we kind of looked at each other and thought this is going to be a bit good. Mm. You know, it was a natural. We could we worked together very very easily. And uh, and bear in mind with Paul, you're always going to be a hired hand. Yes. And I've never been very good at that. So um, that's why, that's what happens. That's, that's the true story. There you go. That might be an exclusive you've got there. Mate. You recently finished your new album, Shine, mm. uh, Abbey Road, and mm. you've made a lot of re references to the, the four track machines still in use there. Yeah. And a lot of musicians mm. view digital recording as rather soulless in comparison and lacking integrity to the original tape to tape, reel to reel mm -hmm. recording. Um, are you in favour of um, the, this older approach? I'm in favour of making the best record you can make. Mm. And love or loathe whatever the modern people, you know, I, I have quite a few of my contemporaries, I won't name names, who would just go, oh, it's all rubbish, that, you know, it's no good. Uh, being at Abbey Road gives you the opportunity to blend the two seamlessly. Yes. Uh, the old machines are there. Uh, I was in Studio 3 recording in April, I think it was last year, or April or May, and my great hero, Mr. McCartney, or Sir Paul, was in Studio 2. And the great thing at Abbey Road is they still retain, and in working order, all of those old machines. So he had, a, uh, in Studio 2, a 60s desk with an eight-track machine, and I'm sure it sounded great. I was working in Studio 3 with, with, with Pro Tools. Yeah. And I'm sure that they, they're not going to suddenly say, well, this won't be very good. If Paul McCartney wants this, it's not going to be any worse than what I was doing. It's easier. What it's done, it's made everybody a recording artist. That's what, that's what the modern 
computer age recording is done. You know, people making literally an album in your bedroom. Mm. You know, I think Ed Sheeran's a great uh, example of that. And he might never make a record as good as that first record he made. You know, some would differ. I don't know. You know, and uh, I think it, as long as you make the record that you want to make, this and and at the stage I'm at now in my career, I was very happy to spend almost a year in Abbey Road, which is great. You know, it was it wasn't there every day, mm. but um, just to be in and out of there. In fact, I'm I'm going to be in there in a few days, and I've been for a few weeks. So I'm looking forward to it. There's a vibe about the place. It's uh, special. Yes, mm. I've heard that. Um, so you played with Whitesnake from 1978 to 1982. Mm. Did you find the advent of MTV around this time and the critical importance of image, sometimes over substance, um, a sad development, or were you in favour of these new theatrical bands like Motley Crue and Guns N' Roses? I, you know, all that happened... What, uh, I mean, I finished with Whitesnake, say, in 82, whereas I think MTV is, is 85, 86, mm. is, is more or less when it began. I remember it beginning, and then... But the whole power of MTV was personified by Here I Go Again. And the White Snake made the, the new White Snake, the ones, ones with five Americans and David in. Um, they, they recorded my song, which was great. But then I started getting phone calls saying, have you seen this video? And have you seen this and have you seen so and so? Nobody mentioned, have you heard the song? And I thought, what are they talking about? Because I wasn't an avid watcher of MTV. Mm. And then I saw the video, you know, with this girl being fairly seductive around her, laying on top of a couple of full, um, English Jaguars. And, I th and if anybody deserved a, a gold platinum disc, it was her, mm. because she's the one uh, who, uh, she was David's wife at the, at the time. And, uh, you know, that record's there, sold millions. Without MTV, I'm not sure it would have done. So I have to be positive about it because from my point of view, I think it, it, it brought the whole thing into the world. Everybody in the world could just turn a TV station on. Mm -hmm. Now it seems mundane and a bit boring because you have many, many, many choices. I mean, in the 80s, that was it. MTV was it. And uh, I think without MTV, I would have uh, not been able to be working the way I am today. So it wasn't until the 2011 reunion that you were able to play your mm. song, Here We Go Again, with David Coverdale? Was no, that, that was the first time that we actually played it together. I, yes. I mean, I'd been playing it at gigs because I wrote it. And he'd, but I don't think he'd done it that much until it was a hit in America. Mm. But it was a hit in the UK with, with the original band. I think it was number nine or number... It was top ten, anyway. And, uh, but the, new, the different they were, was huge. The difference was huge on the... And the sales were different, on uh, huge, huge measures. So, uh, you know, people say, well, you must love that because uh, you've done so well out of it. And, and uh, you know, this, that's true. But it's also a very good song, and it's done very well and continues to do very well. You know, right up, well, this week I've signed off, this month I've signed off two TV slots for it, and I think it's in three movies again last year. So, you know, it just goes on and on. Is it quite a bittersweet moment playing it? in 2011 on stage or was it like No, it was glorious. Yes. It was it was great because I, I he didn't realize um, only about 15 minutes before I walked out in front of 35 40,000 people. I said, "Do you realize we've never played this together?" And he went, "What?" And I said, yeah. I said by the time the record came out, I wasn't in the band anymore." And he went, oh, "I said I wish you hadn't told me that." <laughs> so, you know, next thing is he's, he's introduced me in front of all these people and uh, it was magical. It was really good. Really good. And they played, the, the, you know, they, they see, I'm already, I'm doing it now. They played it. You know, it's like, it's a very different version. Mm. But I know that version almost better than I know my original version because that's the one that um, everybody knows. You know, play, uh, play it to 10 people and nine will know it. Yes. Whether they like it or not, you know, it doesn't make any difference. Play the original version, maybe three people might know it. Yeah. I saw a documentary recently um, where Dave Grohl directed this reel to reel um, it was about his recent oh, album. Oh, Sound City. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm. And he asked the question, um, how do you define feel in terms of playing to the likes of Tom Petty? Mm. How would you define feel? It's a bit like vibrato. B.B. Um, King said a very nice thing about, about me. I didn't realise it was about me and, until 10 years after he said it. And uh, he was on a radio station in Germany and he was asked the perennial question, can white men play the blues? 
And he said, yeah, of course they can play the blues. You know, many, many people can play the blues. He said, his point was how many people could feel the blues. And he came up with a handful of people, and I was one of those people, which was fantastic for me. You know, he was in there, hanging in there with Peter Green and Eric and all these, these guys. And, you know, he said, and Bernie from Weissang, he's, he's he just said, he's got it. If I could market that, then uh, that would be an easy way of making some extra income. Yeah. Uh, feel is, I think you are born with feel. You, know, I don't, you can be born with the, the technique to do everything, but if you haven't got a feel for something. I mean, Nile Rogers with Chic, you know? Yes. I always say that there isn't an app for that. You know, you either do it or you don't, you know? And it was just a, the whole thing with, with Chic, the original Chic was, luckily enough, I got to play with a couple of the guys, uh, sadly, no longer with us, Bernard Edwards and Tony Thompson. And they were as integral to Chic as, 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 as Tony is, um, as Nile is now, you know? But I love that kind of thing anyway. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, you could practice all day, but you'll never play like him, you know. You could do a, maybe an interpretation of it, yes. but it, he, it comes from him, it comes from in here, and you can't buy that. Um, in this Sound City documentary, John McVie, so the original Fleetwood Mac bassist, stated that the new configuration between Stevie Nicks and Lindsay Buckingham was nowhere near the blues, mm. to which the recording engineer replied, no, but a lot nearer the bank. So, do you think this trade-off is inevitable? I, I, I sometimes feel that Whitesnake and Fleetwood Mac are similar. I wouldn't put the two together by any means, but in, especially it's an American thing as well. Whitesnake was a rhythm and blues-based British rock band. Fleetwood Mac originally was a blues band. Mm. You know, you had Peter Green in there, but the Fleetwood Mac name was very good, but it had gone kind of, kind of level, yeah. and the Whitesnake thing had done that. Suddenly they reappear in America with, with Stevie and Lindsay, come out with this monstrous record called Rumours, which Whitesnake did. They did a record, but I think Fleetwood Mac had done an album before Rumours called, just called Fleetwood Mac, and that didn't do anything like what Rumours did, and neither did uh, a record called Slide It In before the 1987 album. And then suddenly both of them are multi-million sellers. So there is a strange analogy, and Peter Green's one of my favorites anyway, and uh, for, oddly enough, we had the same producer as well, a guy called Martin Birch. So there's probably more links there than I've ever thought about, so you've just opened that up for me. But uh, yeah, nearer to the bank, that's a, that's a good, that was John, was it? Or that was somebody in the background, Pro probably the producer. Yes, that was the recording engineer who yeah. said that. <laughs> yeah, well that, that's, without, I mean, pro that pr record probably, people might probably sold more records in Los Angeles than they ever sold in Europe mm. in, in the old days. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But they were a great band, live. Peter Green live, sensational. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> Neil Young has said of the huge commercial success that his song Heart of Gold from Harvest in 1972, that the song put him in the middle of the road and that traveling there soon became a bore and that he was headed for the ditch. Did you ever get bored just playing the same hits to live audiences? No, you know, that's always slightly annoyed me when writers, artists, whatever you want to, they say that because I get a little frustrated about it because without the people buying those records originally, buying Heart of Gold, mm. you know, would he maybe have had the career that he did? People said, oh, did you hear the Neil Young album? or the Hunt? So when a new one came out, you check it out again and you have a fan base. So I, I, I could never get bored playing Here I Go Again or any of those White Snake tunes. Because without White Snake, I wouldn't be talking to you today. And I don't think you, you it's a personal thing. I, I believe that, you know, 100% that uh, you owe your success to the people that you've reached. Okay, you might not do everything they like all the time. They might not like everything you do all the time. But once they've bought something from you and, you, and they follow you, there's a certain obli obligation, I think, to at least say, you want to hear anything? And they yes. say, here I go again. Okay, all right, I'll do it. You know. And I'm sure Neil must believe that. I mean, I know he's had a kind of diverse career, but at the end of the day, he's a singer-songwriter. I mean, I like the really early stuff, Old Man and stuff like that. But uh, you should talk to the guys in Lynn Skinner about Neil Young. They have different versions of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's Sweet Home Alabama. That's yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, whether playing in front of 
100,000 people at the likes of Castle Donington or in mm. front of a few hundred people at the Radcliffe Centre. Mm. Is there a different approach to it? Like I'd probably get more nervous at the Radcliffe, to be honest with you. Because Say nervous, so uh, certainly adrenaline wise, mm. because you're very close. Yes. People can, you know, you can see the whites of their eyes and if they want to ask you a question mid gig, <laughs> they can. You know, whereas if you're in Donington, you know, but then you've got to you've got to work Donington. You've got to you're, you're at the back of that hundred thousand mm. plus crowd. You've paid your fifty pounds, so I I've got to work to you as well. So. Um. So, in the um, early days, you started in small venues like the Marquee, but with modern. But the Marquee was a huge gig to me. Really. Yeah. I mean, when you're when I was local. Uh, playing locally around this area, you know, the furthest we got maybe was to uh, Northampton or a bit further and go over to Oxford. And if you could, got a gig, I had a band called Skinny Cat, which was a local band. We did pretty well, but it was a local, very local thing. And we used to dream of playing at the Marquee. So when I was in UFO and we had a residency there and people were queuing up every Friday all around the corner to see the band I was in, that was a huge thing to me. So where did you start off in? Were you playing in like local pubs or? Yeah, pubs, uh, village halls, uh, weddings, birthday parties. Uh, you play anywhere really. Mm. But you know, Buckingham, when I was 16, was, you know, as, as we said originally, it was a very small place. And it, it, I used to think it was uh, like you said about Bedford, you know. But I realize now with, you know, the hindsight's a wonderful thing. You know, me being a, pretty decent guitar player and I was nowhere near as good as everybody including me thought I was but I was better than most of the people who were playing a bit of guitar yeah. see nowadays you'll, you'll find 100 200 guitar players in Buckingham when I was 16 there was probably five and I was definitely better than the other four and I kept telling them that but secretly thinking I don't think I am really but if you didn't sort of kind of project yourself so it was a different kind of mm. um, different world really so to play all the village halls, but every time you thought, well, I remember playing in places like uh, Steeple Clayton or Twyford or Padbury. And then during the gig, if there, was a, there was ladies there who made tea and sandwiches for you, but they would bring them out during the gig. So you were playing a solo or something, and she'd come out with a cup of tea and a sandwich for you. You'd go, oh, thanks, but not, could you just let me finish? You know? But that was the kind of thing, oh, no, no, I've been told to give you this. Well, yeah, but not now. You know? <laughs> and then the guy would say, if a fight starts, don't stop playing because they'll start on the band. You go, what? No, it's not, not if, when, when, when a fight starts. And, uh, but that's sort of, but you talk to me or talk to anybody from my generation, they'll tell you the same story, whether they're from Buckingham or from uh, Middlesbrough or from Southampton, because we all went through that. Because you know? it wasn't accepted then. It wasn't like you, could, it wasn't, uh, you couldn't say to your teachers at school, oh, I'm going to be in a band. Yeah. It was like, oh, get yourself a real job. You, know? so, you, know, you can't make a living from that. Don't be stupid, boy. You know? Say, so, well, I don't want to, you know, how old are you? Well, I'm 51. Well, what have you been doing all your life? Well, I've been teaching. Well, I don't want to do what you do. I don't want to be 51. And they say, oh, you go away, you're stupid. Yeah. You know, but that's a whole different story. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> was it strange then going to these massive stadium um, concerts and having like television screens of the band mm. where you'd see the artists on a TV oh, screen? I never liked that, yeah. It's good for the people at the back, I guess, you know. Um, no, you kind of got used, you say it sounds blase. You get used to it, because don't forget, when you're on the stage, you don't really see all that. It's like the, the whole production that you see from outside. The band never sees that, you're paying for it. You know, the lighting and the, the effects, the stage effects and stuff, whatever's going on. With Whitesnake, to be honest, we didn't do much, you know, I mean, an, an outrageous stage dress would be maybe a colored shirt or something, you know, but the, I mean, this, this would have probably not been acceptable, but, <laughs> but you know, a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. If you look at back up the pictures of me, you, you, you know, I was never exactly Ziggy Stardust, you know, all the way through. But it seems to have, but people kind of, yeah, they, they, they lock on to that as well. I think, I've always been one of these players or musicians, I think that regular working guys who play a bit of guitar or sing can come to the gig and go, do you know what? I reckon I could do that, you know? Where, whereas if you go and see Jimi Hendrix or Eddie Van Halen, and the, it was like, I'm selling my guitar, you know? So th there's also a lot of psychological we're getting into a different area now, aren't we? There's, there's a, lot of different, uh, a lot of different ways of, you know, p um, perfecting your craft, really. Mm. And I think I've, I've done a pretty good job of that because 
you know, also know your limitations, and, but never lose your expectations. You know, it's yes. one of those kind of things. Did any, Eddie Van Halen's revolutionary playing of one million notes a minute, did that kind of... <coughs> Tap him. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> did it change things for most rock guitarists of your generation? I stood, uh, a great friend of mine was Gary Moore. And uh, we'd known each other since we were 17 or 18. And I stood with Gary at Donington Park when Van Halen played. And we stood on the side of the stage when Eddie was in his... Um, in his prime, I guess, you know. The, I, and I, um, this, the whole tapping thing, you know, which obviously, you know, you know about what it is. I, I, I don't do it. I can't... A lot of people do it badly. Some of the people I know, they do it fairly wrong. And I know some guys do it really well. And it's never really interested me, but it was a bit strange. But when it's done right, when, and Eddie was the master of it, and he, but he was a great guitarist, forget the, the tap inside of it, just his actual playing was, you know, still is sensational. And I remember looking around at Gary, and Gary Moore was not a bad guitar player. <laughs> and his mouth was just going like... And I looked around and he was going like... And I said, good, isn't he? And he went, I had no idea. And that was pretty much... Jaw on the Jaw dropping, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he was that good, and he, and he knew he was that good. Mm. Nothing to do with ego, it was just, you knew how much in, in control of his instrument he was. And it's, it's quite an astonishing sight, but to be stood with one of the greatest guitarists in the world, going, is he that good? I said, yeah, 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 I think he is, don't you? You know? And I said, well, you can do all that, can't you? He said, no. Nah. I mean, I think, and Gary can't speak now, obviously, for himself, I got a feeling that when Gary was on top four, if I'd have been standing with Eddie, I think the same, same would have been said. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I believe that, yeah. yeah. Of course, good questions. Done your homework. Thank you. You got the old, uh, that was a big gig, that was. Yes, this is um, the 1981 yeah. um, programme that yeah. my dad photocopied. He wondered if he'd actually seen it, because um, he's um, kept that for all these years. Wow. He's got pictures of White Snake in there. Oh, great. It's quite well, Everybody good, remembers that like gig as if, as if we were the headliners. Mm. But that was one of our greatest... Because Van Halen were at that gig, weren't they? They, they were at it, yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, I think Eddie and um, the bass player was, I think. Ah, but they're okay. brothers, aren't they? Yes. No, the drummer is the drummer. The drummer's his brother, isn't he? Yes, you're right, yeah. Is that the case that w once you know someone, you know pretty much everyone in the music industry? Well, when you've been at it as long as I have, yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. But I mean, you know, we're all 20-year-olds, and, and now we're all, you know, 60-year-olds. Mm. And none of us, when we were 25-year-olds, thought we'd ever be still playing when we were 45-year-olds. So, but it's just the way it pans out, you know. And, um, you know, good people. And ACDC, you know, biggest band in the world for many years, probably still on a par. And yet, you know, I'm used to going and see them in clubs twice the size of this room, pubs the size of this room, and never thought anything about it. It's a yes. great band, you know, great to watch. Angus, sensational, you know, going on. How do you do that? You know, just, but when we, we went out with, after this, this, we went out with them um, on a European tour. And we went from selling uh, uh, 150,000 albums in Germany to selling like 1.5 million. Mm. Just through doing 10, 15 days with them. Well, that's Perfect the audience for us. Yes, like my dad's got these ticket stubs and he said it would cost a five pounds to go and see that. And yeah. now it would cost 30, yeah, yeah, yeah. 60 pounds. I mean, this is, now, this is a, almost a, well, not a Glastonbury ticket, but certainly 150 pounds, isn't mm, it? Exactly. Like all these bands. Kind yeah, of quite incredible. <laughs> quite good, actually. Oh, we've done the whole thing. Yes, and I think that's all of the programme there. Yeah, oh, brilliant. We've I've probably got one of these somewhere, but I yes. haven't seen it for years. Did you tend to collect the programmes? Yeah, that's when that came out. That was second solo. Yeah. Uh, no, no. See, that, that's the other say downside. Um, you know, you never got to see all the stuff out front, t-shirts and stuff yeah. like that, because you would just go in your, in your in your car backstage, go to your dressing room, and do the gig, and leave. Dear me, being a moody there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on. So. Gibson sold out of the entire 300 copies of the reissue of Your Guitar before they left the factory. Yeah. Um, do you know if Joe Bonamata bought one? No, because Joe, uh, he borrows the real thing. So he, he doesn't need to get one of the reissues because he knows when he comes to England or whatever. You know, just call it. Borrow the beast. Do you want it? 
what do you think? <laughs> so, um, I don't know if he's got one. He may, he may have one, actually. I think he might have got one. He has a pretty close relationship with Goosen. Although, as, as I say, they, I, I wanted to get, uh, two friends of mine you know, in, in England, was, can you get me one? You know, and I said, yeah, yeah, that's all they have for you. I couldn't get them. They'd sold. They'd sold well, out. Yes. So every name had a, every guitar had a name against it before it was made, basically. Which really was very nice and all that, and, uh, but I was quite surprised. Um, you know, 300, they said they could have done a lot more, but they won't do any more because it's a limited edition. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to think they'd do some more in a way, but uh, then my two friends could get one as well. So. I've got number one, though. They gave me number one. And so I now have the real thing and number one, which is quite unique, I suppose. It's quite good. Yeah, that's the beast in that picture. Yeah. And in the film Sliding Doors, the characters take alternative directions in life depending on slight changes in circumstance. And you've been inseparable from your 1959 Les Paul. Mm. Do you ever wonder what if I hadn't acquired the beast? No, I've never thought about that. Um, oh, I guess I'd have got by. Um, I always wanted a Les Paul and it's almost, um, I was kind of stalked with it as well. The guy who I bought it from, um, I, 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 is it serendipity? I was kind of meant to have it really, you know, um, because he wanted more money than I could dream of, you know, and it was ridiculously cheap. But I just, I just don't have that kind of money, you know, and this is in the 70s and he said, oh, I think you should have it. And, and I've only f subsequently found out only in the last year or so, year and a half, uh, that he was a bit of a, he collected early Les Pauls in those days and kind of pointed them in the direction of people. And he decided that this one was the one for me. Wow. So, so in the end, I bought it having not had the money. I still didn't have the money, but he said, cut it, just take it, pay me when you can. Which I did. When I, when I saw him again 30 years later, I thought probably I, I still owe, owe him the equivalent of a quarter of it, which would be about £100,000 now. So. And he said, oh, no, he said, that's all right. We're all done and dusted. Don't worry. I, I don't know, things that go slightly... I mean, the Wings thing, I suppose, the McCartney thing, that would have been a whole career shift, wouldn't it? Mm. But I think meant, things are meant to happen. It just You can't really, you know... I mean, that river keeps rolling out there, doesn't it? It's ain't going to go the other way, is it? You know? That's the way it's meant to go. It's a bit profound, sorry. Yeah, it's a lovely <laughs> analogy. <laughs> um, Van Halen famously had the frankly bizarre band rider of having a bowl of M&Ms backstage with all the brown ones taken out. Which was a joke, you know that. Yes. Yeah. Well, did Whitesnake employ any similar tactics or any of the other bands? No, we, we insisted on corned beef sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> From the tin. To ensure that they'd read the contract, was that? <laughs> no. No. Uh, I think there were things going on. I remember Yes at the time were a big, big, really big band, and I did some show. I was in a group called Wild Turkey, and we opened for Yes, which even to this day amazes me. It's a bit like One Direction opening for Led Zeppelin. But we got on really well, mm. you know, and um, they had stuff on their rider, which even which I knew was true because I saw it, and they had things like uh, goat's milk, which was a special kind of goat's milk that had to be flown into nearly every gig stuff like that. and they say oh yeah it's all true yeah we have to have the goat's milk and there were other things and Rip Waitman uh, to his eternal credit did used to eat a curry during the gig you get steaming off of his ham and all and stuff like that and I'm still like oh, this is kind of weird you know it's like funny really mm -hmm. funny and they, they weren't what you'd call a funny type group they were very serious musicians but there was quite a lot of humour going on but Rick there's always a lot of humour when Rick's around anyway I didn't know him that well in those days because he's, he's fairly local now. His son lives at Akeley. So, wow. yeah. yeah. Good lad, he is. Good lad. But uh, strange things, you know, we could do a whole afternoon of on the road stories, you mm. know, just lots of different things. Of more contemporary artists, I understand you admire Cherry Lee Newis. Are there any other new bands or solo performers that you admire? Yeah, there's quite a few. I like Cherry. Uh, I liked her from the moment I heard her sing. And uh, at the end, you know, when you, when you, you, you know, when you cut the cake kind of thing, and that's that's all that really matters, you know. And I heard this voice before I saw her. Could hear this voice booming out. And uh, you know, she's a good character. She's a nice girl, but she's a really good singer. Uh, 
you know, she's, I guess she's a little bit of a throwback as well. She likes her rhythm and blues. And she writes kind of nice get down kind of songs. Uh, she works very hard. She's, she's under no uh, illusions of like the business owes me a living kind of thing. She's, she does what she has to do to, get to, to, to make it. So I had no qualms with putting her on my album. I, that I wrote a song. Well, then I, soon, I, I mean, I sang it originally and I thought, oh, Cherry will sing this. And she made a great job of it. So she's featured on an album, on a track, and I think the next track is David Coverdale singing. So she'll be up there with all the big boys when it comes out. So she'll do all right. She'll do all right. In your, um, your blues documentary, The Day in the Delta, that was filmed in Mississippi, mm. wasn't it? Um, do the two forms of the music and the filming, do they overlap easily? With the yeah, you can't really help it when you're there. It's, um, I mean, I'm no pre-war Delta blues man by any means. And, and there's obviously, there's none of them left really now. I've got to know two or three guys over the last 20 years who sadly no longer with us, but uh, Honey Boy Edwards played in Buckingham. I went to see him at the town hall. This is a guy who taught, say, taught, he didn't call it touring, but he, he was on the road with Robert Johnson. And then to think that he's played a gig in Buckingham Town Hall. And I, I contacted the uh, promoter to say, hey, give me a ticket or I'm, I'll introduce him for you, you know. So either way, I'm going to be there, you know. And he said, well, that'd be great. And then we did that and I kept in contact with him. I went to see him in Chicago. And a guy called uh, John Jackson, real great troubadour, sadly gone now as well. He was at my house. I've got some nice old pieces of film of him with a bit of film with Olivia, actually. And um, these guys, you know, they're irreplaceable. But when you're there, it's in the air. You know, there's, there's a bit going on. And I went to the Dockery Plantation. But Clarksdale, Mississippi itself is, it could still be 1935 down in some parts of it. On the top side of town, you know, it's like any other town in America. You kind of just go downtown off the tracks. And uh, I was I re-edited uh, the whole thing last week, actually, so I'll get a copy of that to you. You can have a look at it. It's good. It's come out good. I'm really pleased with it. It's a home movie, really. But uh, again, it's down to passion, really, and doing it from them. The, the Americans were very impressed. They said, oh, you're very well uh, prepared. And I said, what, what do you mean? Because we're doing what we're doing now. I said, what do you mean? I said, I'm just, when the cameras say, well, we're on, I'm just talking, I mean, nothing's prepared. I said, but you know so much about it. I said, well, I've grown up with it since I was a kid. You know, I know about these places. I, all I ever saw of what I'm looking at now, I've seen in books. Mm. And now I'm here and I want to, you know, celebrate it really. But I got to know some real nice people down there and I've made some good friends down there. And uh, I go back now and they, I walk along the streets there and it's only like being in Buckingham, smaller. And I get people shout across the street, hey, Englishman, how you doing? And say, I do have a name, you know. Yeah, all right, English. Yeah, you know, they'll be playing in the club the night before they, and they don't really care. You know, it's like, they say, who's that? They say, oh, that's Paul McCartney. Who? You know, they don't care. Really. It's like, you just play. If you can play good, they like it. Yeah. You know? yeah, so. Playing Clarksdale. As they, they say, if you played in Clarksdale in the 30s and 40s, you could play anywhere because they would tear you to shreds. So I've played in Clarksdale and I seem to have survived, so that's all right. Happy <laughs> You've worked with productions um, with Nicholas Heitner on um, Shakespeare productions at the National Theatre. Yeah. How did that come about? Through um, a friend of mine, a musical colleague. Um, he was the musical director for both of those productions. And Nick Heitner, or Sir Nicholas as he is now, um, he wanted something for, the first one we did was A Winter's Tale, and he wanted something kind of a bit radical. And uh, it certainly was, you know, it was more like uh, Pink Floyd than anything that had ever been done before, I guess, if you want an analogy. It was just me and Simon. And I had to appear on stage in a part of the scene. There's a scene in The Winter's Tale, which is a market scene, market, like, almost like a fair. And he transformed that into basically Glastonbury. So I had to be on stage with an acoustic guitar. I just wish I'd taken out a bet in the 1990s that I'd be on stage of the National Theatre in a Shakespeare production. I would have probably got 500,000 to one. Guy never thought of it. But, you know, there's, there's your career for you. You don't know what's going to happen. And a couple of years later, um, Nick, Nicholas uh, called again and said, we're doing Henry V. 
And that was the hottest show in town. That was great. With a guy called, uh, oh, who's the, what's his name? Uh, Adrian Lester. And uh, he was fantastic, really good. And I got to know, obviously, a lot of actors. And I was a little bit in awe, really, because it was, I was out of my comfort zone, you know, being at the National Theatre. And Helen Mirren would pop in, and all these, and Bill Patterson, and uh, uh, all sorts of actors I'd seen on TV many, many, many times. And then yeah, they'd, they'd come and say, oh, I saw, I saw the show yesterday afternoon or last night. I'd go, oh, where were you? I said, I was at the, really good, the music's great, it's really radical. And, oh, thanks. And you, suddenly you, the community comes in, and uh, you get to know these people on a different level. And I, I think actors work harder than musicians, to be honest with you. I think they do, because of the discipline that's involved. I mean, the, the hardest thing for me, that, that whole three month, four month run, both times, was me having to be in London every day at a certain time. Mm -hmm. Because if I wasn't there, they couldn't do the show. You know, unless I'd depped it the day before. So I, was, I got to be leave. I, I, I could easily leave at uh, four o'clock to get there for, you know, for six. But I was leaving like, three o'clock, two o'clock, one o'clock, because I'd become so fixated with, you know, being there. And that was a whole different, you know, ball game for me. And, it, and very positive. It made me, you know, conscious of being like a part of a team, which is when you're in a band, even though that seems like you should be, it, sometimes it's not, you know. The people say, uh, oh, well, you work with this guy for five years in a band, you know, you must have been the best of mates. And, no, not really. You know, we were on stage from nine until 10.30 every night. But after that, we just went like that, mm. you know. And sometimes you, you build friends, but, you know, not many. You build up what you do, and same with you, and they might, might not want to be with me, you know. Works both ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the, the, the uh, theatre stuff was great. Yeah, I'd like to do it again, actually. Yeah. So Heitner's doing another Shakespeare, I'm sure it'll call me. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so, of, of all the albums you've recorded, is there one of which you're most proud, and if so, why? I suppose the one which um, means, to say proud, I mean, the, the first record you ever do is just like, yeah, I'm on a record, you know, the, because you, you want to make a record. This whole thing, you know, make, make any money? No, that doesn't come into it, make a record. So the first record I ever made, I was very proud of, I suppose, that had my name on the sleeve, you know, on guitar. You know. But one that means the most to me, I guess, is that when you first, uh, because a lot of my contemporaries, I mean, more than nine out of 10 of people like me, have nothing tangible to show uh, for a 30, 40 year career. So I have a lot of gold and silver and platinum discs. But the first, the first one, if the house was falling down, the one I'd go and get would be the first one. So that was ready and willing. So the first one, they said, oh, you've got a silver album. You've done 60,000 copies in the UK. And then suddenly this silver disc comes in and it's like, wow, you know. And then you think, well, I'm never going to know. I know. I know people with longer careers than me, more talented than me, that have one silver disc for a single, you know, or something like that. Well, I, you know, fortunately, I've got a, quite a lot more, you know. It doesn't mean that much, but at least it, you, you have something for, you know. And they, when people visit the house, it's, you know, and I've got them up in the studio or in the whatever, and it's like, you, I take them for granted because I see them every day. But people haven't seen, they see one, but then they see a wall full and, you know, there's all different ones, different countries and stuff. But I got brought back to earth very, hum with a great humbly, humbling, uh, I, I was um, quite good friends with George Harrison. He didn't have to use this, but uh, he said to me, I was at his house one afternoon, he said, oh, would you like to see the studio? And I said, yeah, great. And we went up to see his studio, and this fantastic house he, he had in Hamley. And, and George was a lovely, really lovely guy. Can't tell you how, and I was always pinching myself, so, oh, George Harrison. It was long before the, you know, you need to think if I ever got to be one to one with George Harrison, he'd phone you up. And uh, I was looking around the room and I said, I said, I said so you haven't got any gold discs up, you know? So everybody's got a gold disc. It was certainly in the toilet, people put them in the toilet, you know, gold disc in the toilet, kind of thing. And he said, Oh, I've got a few. He said, I'm sure you have, George. And we're walking along this kind of corridor and, uh, he said, all the, all, the, all the discs are in there, in this room. So he showed me, opened the door. And they were on the floor, just in rows. Just, you know, and they're, they're about that deep, right? 
and they went a room like this, just back to back. Oh, so oh, we said they just arrive all the time. I said there's no there's nowhere to put them really. And I thought, well, no matter how many people I meet, mean, it's like, yeah, that's that's been in the Beatles, yeah, kind of special. It's like you know. It was wonderful, wonderful thing to see. And he also had the Sergeant Pepper's uniform he had there as well, which was in, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, almost in a carrier bag. So I was the Sergeant Pepper's. <gasps> <laughs> like Things that. like that, yeah, you know. Yeah, goodness. Because you know. isn't your favourite album, Revolver by yeah, yeah. Yes. And when I did Shine, it was in three, Studio Three, which mm. is, they did nearly everything in Studio Two, but they did Revolver in three. Oh. And Dark Side of the Moon was done in three, and I saw, all the time I'm like, wow. Yeah. Is there any reason in particular why Revolver's your favourite? Because there are a lot of the songs in there are about relationships, aren't they? Yeah, I, I think that the overall sound of Revolver is, is, is warm and accommodating, and you know, every track kind of sucks you in a little bit more. And I think oh, uh, Yellow Submarine, that one yeah. sticks out like a sword. But, you know, I got it? to play Yellow <laughs> Submarine live with Ringo and I went in his band. And Yellow Submarine is the simplest kid song when you hear it on the record. When you're playing it with one of the Beatles singing it as close as we are now, it's one of the hardest songs to play. But it's a strange thing, but on there, you know, you kind of, it's, it's that kind of A to Z element of the Beatles. Mm. You know, you've got Yellow Submarine, you've got I'm Only Sleeping. And George, a tax man at the front, but McCartney plays the lead guitar solo. Did you know that? No, I didn't. Yeah, it's Paul. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was really, you know, I, I, I just like, I mean, I like them all. I'm a Beatles freak, but uh, Revolver, everybody, everybody goes for the White Album or, or Sergeant Pepper, obviously, but Revolver just seems to be that transition, you know, and Beatles for Sale is getting there, but Revolver's the one before Sergeant Pepper when everybody said, well, well that was their peak. And I think they made, for me, they peaked just a little bit before that with, with Revolver. Just personal thing. No, no, I completely understand. I love um, <laughs> Eleanor Rigby on yeah. that track, just oh, superlative. Really. Have you ever heard the version of Eleanor Rigby with just the strings? No, I haven't. Have you? I but like, I love the string part in there. Like yeah, well, there's a version of it with, with just the string section. Oh, okay. No vocals at all. It's yeah. amazing. I bet. It's got its whole character of its own, isn't yeah. it? Just what are your future pan plans for filming and recording? Well, the, the Delta film's done. I'd like... Uh, I'd like to do something, if you'd have said to me, even two years ago, you'd have been fronting a film, you know, presenting it. Because I have a good face for radio these days, you know, I mean, you know, you still see yourself like here, you know, like, it's like, and you think, no, no, you know, you're not like that anymore. You know, you're an old bloke now. But doing it was a lot of fun, maybe because of the subject matter, because I'm really into it, but being there, but it really is, it's a little bit like a travelogue of uh, Clarksdale, to be honest with you. I'm Clarksdale people will love me for it, because I keep saying, come to Clarksdale. It's great, you know. Music, you know, music centre of the 30s, you know. You know. But uh, Jimmy Page and Robert Plant went, went there. They made an album called Walking Out of Clarksdale or something. And there's a mural in the middle of Clarksdale. There's a, on a street corner, there's a mural of Robert in his Led Zeppelin heyday, you know, of about when he's like 22 or something. Somebody just bothered to paint it on there after walking into Clarksdale, so it's kind of nice. Mm, I, in fact, I sent him an email. I, 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 uh, I took a photograph and sent it to him while I was there. It's a bit of, I've already seen it. So. Just in case. Okay. Yeah. So, so when might we next expect you to see back, you back at the Radcliffe Centre? Probably in the autumn. I like doing the Radcliffe gig, um, especially these days. Now it's, you know, with the refurb. You know, and I was kind of involved in some of that with the sound system, which is nice. And the last one we did for the, did a fundraiser for the Friends of the Uni and stuff. And, and it's always nice to see the VC down the front, you know, enjoying some music. It's good. It's, uh, he's, you know, I like his energy. It's good. It's good. I think it's a, a nice gig to play. And it's nice. It's a strange gig because I'm always very conscious of, because it's a local gig, you know, I've always, like, you never know who's going to come, you never know what, I did a, what, two, two sets of gigs ago, I did a Q&A, &A. and that's a bit like, you know, saying, you know, don't go near that door, because, you know, and go, why, you know, because you don't, locally, you know, what questions are going to come at you, you just really don't know, you know, if you're in a, a gig where nobody knows you other than what you do, 
you get, they're going to be music related questions. Well, I got stuff coming at me from school. Do you remember so and so? And I go, oh yeah. You know, I thought, oh God, what's coming next? I want my, open myself up for him. But the atmosphere in there is always great, really good. We recorded, the, we videoed last year. I don't know whether there's a video, I filmed it. I think, I haven't even seen that yet, but there is a film of it. And we recorded it as well. So it's in the can, everything's always in the can. <laughs> at your dream dinner party, who would you invite? Poo. Living or deceased? Both. Both. John Lennon. Is Lennon because you haven't had the opportunity? To Len Lennon, funnily enough, I'm, I've met all three of the other Beatles were, and played with two of them. Ironically, not with the one I was supposed to play with. <laughs> but Lennon was, all, but Lennon was when I was a kid, he was my favourite. And I always had this feeling in the 70s that, that and I'm going to play with him one day. You know, that, you know, I will, you know, I'll make the effort, I'll make, make sure I'm in the right place at the right time, because you can do that. That's, that's not also, you know, preordained. You can make yourself be in the right place sometimes. But of course, it never came to pass. Uh, but I always liked him. Uh, I liked his attitude and his, and the, his music was not bad either. But, uh, but the two of them were a great, God, were they? Yin and Yang, really. You know, the light and shade thing. Who else would have a dinner party? I can't think of any. Call me out now, you have there. Would you compare your relationship with David Coverdale to the Lennon and McCartney yeah. bond? Yeah. Yeah, I would, yeah. I mean, we, we, never, had a, we never had to force um, an issue, songwriting-wise. It was always a, a natural balance. And always open to saying, well, yeah, that bit's really good, but what about this? And, oh, I think your bit's better. You know, it's never like, well, actually, I think my bit's better. And we say, mm, well, let's see, let's record the two, let's work it out. And it was all, and, but I always thought, lyrically, it, he was pretty much income, you know, he would always do the lyrics, regardless. Even if he came up with some of the other parts, you know, the, you know, the middle bits and whatever. But no, it was always one of those situations that, uh, and on a working basis as well. We, that was a strange thing that when the band broke up originally in uh, 82, we never had a row or a fight or anything like that. It just kind of drifted. And I've always, you know, always thought that was a sad way to, you know, we should have done, uh, well, we'll say we should have done, we could have done what Queen used to do in those days. And they just drift apart from each other for, for nine months, you know, and then come back and make a record. Mm -hmm. We could have done that. But David wanted to move to America and you know, the rest is history, as they say. But no, we, we have a, and we have a really nice relationship now. In fact, I had an email from him this morning. So, you can, in fact, he emails me and texts me more than I return it. So, I'm, I'm bad at that, really. But uh, it's really good. To, uh, I'm off to uh, New York in a couple of weeks. I'm going to be playing with the Allman Brothers, aren't I? So, it goes on. Yes. It goes on. Brilliant. Thank you very much for your time. I really My pleasure. It. My pleasure. Can turn it off now. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
that'll be alright. Are they swallows on your... Um, yeah. Yeah, birds, yeah. They're really lovely. Yeah. Quite good. There's a big PRS thing. Do you play the plectrum? I yeah. play the plectrum on electric guitar. <laughs> Otherwise. So different, that's so. Thank you. News at 10, Tambo Mill. There you go.